Do you know what the best movie of the year 1998 was? The Prince of Egypt. The great animated tale, The Prince of Egypt. But what made it so epic? Was it that it was voice casted with Val Kilmer, Helen Mirren, Patrick Stewart, Ralph Fiennes, Jeff Goldblum, Steve Martin, Martin Short, Danny Glover, and 1998 sensation Sandra Bullock? Was it the great animation? Was it the really good songwriting? I mean, all those things helped, but what made it so great was the drama that unfolded, the story that there was to tell in this movie. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it today. Uh, it's been since 1998, though, so sorry. Uh, you know, but you should go back and watch it if you haven't seen it. It's a great telling in a fictionalized way of a very true story. And that's where we are today. Today, as we continue through our journey through the book of Exodus, we're at this part where we're in this historical account of a very dramatic series of events that unfold over five chapters. Today, we will see how God sends his message to Pharaoh. Here we read sort of the the forefront piece, you know, this is the, the foreshadowing God's giving Moses and Aaron in our scripture reading today, a little insight in what's going to happen. He tells them, you're going to go as you already have. You're going to say, let God's people go. He's going to say no. And then I am going to show him why he should. I'm going to put the miraculous on display. And eventually there's going to be no question that I I'm God. What's interesting to ask, though, when we think about that is, what took God to such an extent that he would go on to send 10 plagues? What took God to this place that he would say, I really need to show this guy who I am? Well, it's actually one little comment. One little phrase that we so quickly overlook as we go through the book of Exodus. This one little thing that Pharaoh has to say is what leads us into five chapters of epic proportion, which end up shaping the Jewish identity even to this very day. It was something that Pharaoh said to Moses about God, which, chose, which led God to choose to reveal who he was in this way. If we look back at Exodus chapter 5 in verse 2, we see this challenge that Pharaoh has when Moses comes to ask him to release God's people into the wilderness. Here's what Pharaoh has to say. He said, well, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? It goes on and says, I don't even know the Lord, so I will not let Israel go. So what we see coming on, that begins to unfold through chapter 6 in the preparation, chapter 7 in Moses going to Pharaoh, and then all the way through to the end of chapter 12, where God finalizes his 10th plague, is that God is answering that question. You see, Pharaoh likens himself to be a deity. In his culture, in his time, in his own mind, he is God. And he's going to live that way. And so when Moses and Aaron come up out of the wilderness and he says, well, really, who's your God? He's saying, it doesn't really matter. Because I am the God who's in control. And he's one of many gods. There's a whole pantheon of gods over Egypt, and he likened himself to be one of them. And so really, Moses and Aaron, you don't have all that much to say, Pharaoh says. So through the miraculous interventions, God ends up sending these plagues with a purpose to reveal that what Moses and Aaron had to say is actually to be obeyed. Because it's not Pharaoh or any of the Egyptian gods who are in control, but it's he as the God of Israel who is the one to be obeyed. Now, there's this little dramatic thing, though, that takes place before we get to the ten plagues. Oftentimes what happens is we remember the story of Moses and Aaron going, saying, 
let my people go. Pharaoh says no. And then, all of a sudden, ten plagues. But if we remember the story that way, we've actually skipped a very important part that takes place in the middle. In the verses that follow what Marge just read, we read this. Exodus chapter 7, verse 8 to 13. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. But Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord said. Now to us, it, it doesn't, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. It's why we skip towards the ten plagues. I mean, there's, there's the drama. I mean, ten plagues which culminate in uh, the death of the firstborn son of the Egyptian people. That, that's where we kind of want to skip to. But if we miss out on this little piece, miss out on a big message that God was sending, this thing that seems insignificant would have been maddening to the Pharaoh. If these snakes were a sign of the Egyptian religion, Snakes were to be feared amongst that place because there was a dangerous breed of cobra which could kill you any number of which ways. And so as the pharaohs and the sorcerers and the people who were involved in the religious clergy of their day, they decided to take this fearsome snake and make it a symbol of their gods and particularly of the pharaoh. In fact, this snake became such a symbol that the Pharaoh would wear it upon his royal crown and when receiving the crown, had an oath that would have to take place. Here's the oath. It's on the screen for you to read. This is what they would receive as they received the serpent's emblem upon their royal crown as they took the throne. They would say, O great one, O magician, O fiery snake. Let there be a terror of me like the terror of thee. Let there be a fear of me like the fear of thee. Let there be an awe of me like the awe of thee. Let me rule a leader of the living. Let me be powerful, a leader of the spirits. To be a pharaoh was to be among the gods and to Become a pharaoh meant to identify with the most dangerous and deadly of the snakes they had in their land. And it was to also recognize that the serpent was a symbol of evil power. And that was an identity you wanted to take. And so when there is this battle that takes place of a few different snakes, there's a powerful message that's relayed. Now this is something that we see and we can sort of just skim by, but it's actually something that's been passed down for so long to this very day. In fact, if you were to go to certain parts of Egypt to today, you would still see people performing magic with this cobra, this type of snake. What would happen is that when, Mo, when Aaron threw down his staff, this snake appeared, so this rod of wood becomes a snake, but the magicians had found another way. They would pick up these Egyptian cobras by the nape of their neck, and there's actually a nerve right in the nape of the neck, and if you press it with enough strength, the snake goes rigid and immobile. And from a distance, it actually looks as if it is a cane. And so what the magicians and sorcerers of the day would do is when they went into Pharaoh's court to represent the official religion, which was Pharaoh at the top in their day, they would go into a bin of snakes, they would reach in, grab a cobra by the nape, and they would walk in. And that way, if anyone were to challenge Pharaoh, they could simply cast that staff down onto the ground. 
And when the snake would hit the surface of the ground, it would be jolted out of its immobilized snake, and it would panic and go to strike whatever was closest. It was a way to strike fear into the heart of men and women who would dare to challenge Pharaoh or any of the Egyptians' gods. And so they were certain when Pharaoh comes and performed this little trick that, ha, we know what he's doing. And so they cast down their snakes. But there was a problem. Instead of those cobras being able to rise up and strike Moses and Arrow dead, showing that truly Pharaoh is the hero of the day, the supernatural rod that God had shaped into a snake consumed the snakes that Pharaoh's sorcerers had thrown to the ground. Imagine how shocking that would be. This isn't something cobras really do. They don't just go around consuming up all a whole bunch of other cobras, particularly these other territorial, venomous female snakes, though they would scatter off typically. Now in this day, what would have happened should have been that God was vindicated in that place. I mean, we are talking about a culture that prides itself on a pantheon of gods, and when they believe they've discovered a new one, they find its place in the, the whole sort of database to say, okay, this is this god, and it is above that god, and it needs to be worshipped in this sort of way. So what should have happened in this place was that Pharaoh should have gone, okay, you win. Your god has eaten my snakes. But Pharaoh's heart wouldn't allow him to be humbled. It wouldn't allow him to actually receive the truth that God was sending him. He wasn't picking up on the message that was being put down in that place. And so he rejected what was revealed. And he, in fact, he would go on to reject it nine more times after this until after the 10th plague. Now, before we get to the plague, I also want to talk about this idea of God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh's heart being hardened. This is something that we see not just here, but also in other places in the New Testament. There's places where, we reveal, where it's revealed that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and didn't receive him and, and save him. And, and that can be really challenging. This can be one of those things that makes people say, well, God was different back then than he is now. It can make us feel like, well, well something must be wrong because we read about Jesus and we read about the New Testament and we see the, this God of love and this God of forgiveness and this God of mercy. And, and this doesn't just really jive with that very easily. It feels like on the surface that it's, it's kind of unloving. It's kind of cruel and it's difficult to see what takes place. But what's really helpful as we comb through these scriptures is we see that there's a progression of what takes place. This is the first account where we read that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But there will actually be 10 references to Pharaoh's heart being hardened through the chapters here where this dramatic sort of event unfolds. Six times, though, we'll read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but only four times did we, do we read that God hardened it. And it's important to note that God doesn't it's not attributed to God of him hardening Pharaoh's heart until after the sixth plague. And this is really crucial for us to understand because this tells us something theologically. It tells us something about us and our response towards God. Because the question could be, well, could God block out? Does God choose to stop people from receiving this? And it's really difficulty because we live with the scripture that holds a tension that there's this piece of God's sovereignty and then there's this piece where, where people get to make a choice and, and how does that have some type of interplay and what does that mean for us today? Well, it's important to recognize a tension takes place because before God ever hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh did it of his own volition. When it says here in the scriptures, and it's kind of vague, in the translation that we use, it, but it seems like it's sort of something that passively happens. Well, Pharaoh got kind of angry, and that's what, what hardened his heart. 
But when we, we look at the Hebrew that this was originally written in, we actually see that what took place was something that was intentional. There was an action that took place. When Pharaoh, who saw himself as God, saw an affront to himself, what he said is, I'm going to steal up and double down and dig my heels in to fight against this God. And that took place six times. And so what the scripture is revealing to us is that Pharaoh was a callous and evil-minded person who chose to ignore the innocence of God's people, the truth about who God was, and the love that God offered initially to be able to respond to who he was. In a way, for those who like Shakespeare, it's like that scene in Macbeth. There's a scene in Act 3 of Macbeth where, where Macbeth has murdered the king and he's given a choice to either admit to his actions and come clean or to keep on murdering. And he's torn because he doesn't know what to do, but eventually he ends up saying, I am in blood stepped so far that I should wade no more, but returning were as tedious as continuing to go over. Pharaoh comes to a place eventually where he's decided, I've doubled down enough. I don't have the humility. I'm going to keep on going. And so after he's rejected God, after he has decided, he has said what he has to say, God continues to allow Pharaoh to choose. In a way, he actually sort of accentuates it to bring about a greater good. I think unless God actually sent the ten plagues, there would have been a, a real strong chance, especially as we look at the Israelites in the wilderness and they go on, that they would have turned back to going towards Egypt and worshiping their gods and their king. But it doesn't happen this way. In fact, as one scholar says, the author of the book of Exodus wants us to see that even the most heinous and absurd forms of human evil are not a true threat to God's purposes. He can steer even this kind of evil towards his plan to bless all humanity through Abraham's family. When we look at the idea that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it shouldn't be threatening. It shouldn't actually be something that, that, that strikes fear into us. It should be something that draws awe into our lungs. We should be amazed that God can take even the most evil of actions from the most evil and heinous of all men to bring out good for those who love him. And so we see after God has shown and revealed to Pharaoh that he is going to consume him, that he really is the one in power. The plagues that God sends are a message. From chapter 7 all the way through chapter 8, we, we see that there's this sign time and time again. And, and for us in our culture, again, this is something that we can kind of just wade on through, and it can kind of be strange, like, why did God send a bunch of frogs? Why were there gnats and flies? Like, I mean, that's, that's annoying, but, but really, like, why would he choose that? Well, in the midst of this all, what he's doing is sending a message to each one of the pantheons of gods that the Egyptians worship. Now, we don't have time to read through all this today, and so I hope like in the newsletter where it says, read this ahead of worship, that you were able to do that. By the way, if you don't get our newsletter, sign up, because every week as we go through Exodus, we're fast-forwarding, and so you can pre-read uh, what there is. Uh, and if you don't, go back today and take a look after I've shown you how these different things reveal who God is over the Egyptians' gods and allow it to sort of tweak your thinking to see who God really is as he's revealing himself over Pharaoh. 
And that really is what's happening. There's no question about it because we see actually at the end of all that takes place, or right towards the end in Exodus chapter 12, God clarifies what happens. He says, On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. This goes on to be referenced in other places. This idea that the ten plagues were actually God's divine justice being enacted on the people who worshipped other gods. We see this referenced in Numbers 33 and Jeremiah 46. But let me show you what I mean. On this, There's going to be a chart on the screen here. And uh, it's a little hard to see, so take a picture. Zoom in on your phone if you want. But this lists on the left side all of the ten plagues. Then on the right side, it actually references the Egyptian deities, the gods, that they worshipped. So when God turned the water into blood, this was a big deal because the Egyptians worshipped Happy, who was the Nile god. And the Nile and Happy were considered important because economically they required on the water, they required the water source, they required it physically for waters to be able to be consumed, to drink, and to, to water their fields, and to take care of their livestock, and all this sort of thing. And so immediately, when God turns the waters of the Nile into blood, it spits in the face of this Egyptian god, one who is most certainly one of the most important, because the Nile is sacred to the Egyptians in this day. Next, God pulls frogs out from within the water and sends them in as a plague. This is directly an attack on Hecate, who is the god of fertility, a god who was represented by having the head of a frog. Next, gnats come up from the dust of the earth. Well, this was, again, mockery of Geb. The Egyptians had a god of the earth who controlled all things that came out from the earth. Then a swarm of flies. So we've got the water, we've got the land, and now we have the skies. The swarm of flies come. And this was to mock Kepri, who was the god of creation and rebirth, who is represented with the head of a fly. The death of the cattle. We have Hathor, the god of protection, right? We're, we're, We're halfway here. And in the middle of the half, if there was any question, any challenge, God says, I'm going to take your one God who represents all that protects you, and I'm going to spit in his face. And he takes out the cattle. Next, he brings boils on the people. This is an affront to Isis, the God of healing. Then hail and lightning. This, this is a reflection of not the sky god. Locusts are a response to Seth, the deity of storms and other disasters. Because maybe, just maybe, at this point, Seth is upset. I mean, we have a god just in case there's a natural disaster so we can feel things building, right? We've, we've made fun of all these other gods and maybe Seth really just needs to be moved up that database to say, oh, he's actually more powerful than even Hathor, the god of protection, so we should look at him. Well, God says, no way. I'm going to take him down too. And so he takes on Seth and then he goes after the most powerful of the Egyptian gods outside of Pharaoh as deity, he goes after Re, which is the god associated with the sun. This is the top dog god, and God says, no, I'm going to blot out things and bring darkness to your land. Now, man, Pharaoh really should have just listened by this point. But he continued to hold himself as deity. He continued to say, well, you know, those are some of the gods, but I am the king. It's okay. We still have a battle to be won, and I still can take the victory. That was until God reached in and touched Pharaoh and all his people in all the land as he affected them with the death of the firstborn. This is an incredibly difficult passage to receive if we do not understand the unwillingness of people to come before God. 
God actually wanted to bring love and mercy. He wanted to bring people into worship of him. But because of the arrogance and the evil that was set against him, these are the things that he brought. And God used everything. He used land, water, sky to bring be places where the plagues appeared from. He impacted the people religiously, mentally, emotionally, economically, spiritually, relationally, right? All of these aspects of life were impacted by the ten plagues. There was no part of your life that you could have said, whew, at least that part went away unscathed. No, God came across all of it to reveal his power and his superiority over each of the Egyptian gods, showing that he was not just God over Israel, but he was God over all things. Now, eventually, of course, this, the last one leads Pharaoh to commanding uh, his people to let God's people go to the wilderness. He says, I can't take it anymore. Just get out of this place. And there's some stuff that takes place that happens after that. But what we need to understand is this is a message that God needs to bring. As God's people go out into the wilderness, God would later go on to give what we have come to know affectionately as the Ten Commandments. And at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, God gives some wisdom for all people who would follow him through all things. And it's meant to be connected to these ten plagues. We're meant to see the connection through history to be a warning to all of us. As God gives his commandments, what does he start with? You'll have no other gods before me. Why does he say that? Because anything else that we do is ultimately wrong because... It's putting other things greater than him. God says, I want the whole of every person's heart, soul, mind, and strength focused on me. And I want you to realize who I am. I want you to see what I can bring. And the Israelites were the beneficiaries of this first in the fact that they got to, as they followed God and wrestled through these things and experienced some of God's mercy because they strayed away and built some idols and did some other things, but they got to receive the good things that God brings. And God continues to do that to this day. God continues to give this message to us through generations so that we can see that we should worship him, that he should be the thing that consumes our hearts and minds. He should be the thing that we humble ourselves after. And we're fortunate. We are fortunate to live in this time and place where we get to live after God not only displayed his power in that, but that he also displayed his power later through what Jesus did on the cross. God has shown that there is nothing that he wouldn't do to bring people to himself, to reveal who he would be, and to invite us in to better things. God used history, and that's a difficult question to ask. Why did he do it this way? Why do we get to be the beneficiaries and not those people? And the truth is, I can't tell you all those answers. Because God knows far more than what he's revealed to us in this time and place. But what he has given us is enough. Enough to know he loves us. Enough to know that he wants us to be with him. And enough to know what we can do is the right thing. Which is to put him as God above all other things in our lives. To receive the blessings that flow from that. And so with that message in mind, as we read these things, this ancient historical account, the question that comes is, what are you worshiping? That was the question I had to ask myself as I reflected on this text this week. Is, you know, it's, it's easy to look at the account of Pharaoh and just be like, what an idiot. Like, 
I certainly don't live that way. But upon some reflection, upon some soul work and digging, I was actually brought to this place where I realized, no, there are places where I've hardened my hearts. And I've said, no, I'm king over this space. There are things that captivate my attention to the point where I elevate them above almost everything. In some cases, over everything. The reality is, it wasn't just Pharaoh who worshipped himself and other gods. It's every single one of us to this day. And it's not Christian, just Christians who grab a hold of that message. There's this commencement speech, and I've shared it with uh, our church a number of times over the years because it's just so captivating. It has brought me back. It was uh, given, I think it was in 2005 or 2008, at Kenyon College by the American novelist David Foster Wallace. This guy wasn't a Christian. He was a, quite a, a train wreck, but he had this really, in, really deep insight into the way we think. The way we approach life and humanity as people in the Western world, particularly through sort of a North American lens. And he is someone who, who didn't identify with Christian things, went on to say this. He said, here's one example of the other, utter wrongness of something I tend to automatically be sure of. Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. We rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive, but it's pretty much the same for all of us deep down. It's our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There is no experience you've had that you were not at the absolute center of. The world as you as experience it is right there in front of you or behind you, to the left of you or to the right of you, on your TV, on your monitor, or whatever. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. You get the idea. People who play video games call this first player thinking. Say, I'm not an NPC. I'm not a non-player character. That's everybody else. I'm the one in control. I'm the one going about doing certain things. Our experience tells us, if we aren't wise to the truth of the world around us, that we are the main thing. We are all pharaohs of our own sorts. And that leads us to worshiping all sorts of things. Foster Wallace goes on to say, here's something else that's true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of your adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. Pharaoh had a choice and he made it. The question is, will you choose similar things? What do you choose to worship? What do you need to surrender in order to receive things from God? While God might not send plagues to catch your or my attention, we have to be careful to recognize the significant consequences that stem from our selfish, idol-worshipping thinking. The things we worship end up hardening our hearts. They end up numbing our souls, and ultimately they lead us toward death if we're worshiping anything other than Jesus. And what is worse is that if we're not careful in our way of being, it just continues to cascade. 
One of the most powerful illustrations of this is at the beginning of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, we see that as people reject God, he allows us to be given over. This is what Paul says. He says, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not, what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They're gossips and slanders and God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. We can look at that with a distance and say, oh, what a terrible thing. But when we really stop to think, and acknowledge where our own sin takes us, we realize we get swept up in those things. I get swept up in those things. I become one of these people. It's not a those people problem. It's an every one of us thing. And so for those who are followers of Jesus, the call on our lives is to continue to move away from these things that we read about in Romans chapter 1, towards him it's to continually deny ourselves as kings and queens to recognize the only one who should be acknowledged with that title we need to take off our worship of other things we need to get rid of these things called idols these these images that are used to represent a god for the purpose of worshiping How do we know what this is? Well, Tim Keller gives us a healthy definition. He says, what is an idol? It's anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than him. Anything you seek to give you what only he can give. Again, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have to put God above all else. And the good thing is, unlike how our worship of self brings things cascading down into darkness as we begin to elevate God, we get raised up into new life and into the light of what only God can bring. Now, this isn't just an easy thing. It's a lifelong journey. Every single one of us is a part of it if we choose to follow Jesus. But it is possible to continue to see movement and momentum that will carry us in these things. But it takes process. It takes work. And so let me give us just a couple steps that we can do to begin to move towards God instead of having the experience of Pharaoh. The first thing that we need to do is discern what our idols are. Archbishop Archbishop William Temple said this. This is how you can identify what your idols are. He said, your religion is what you do with your solitude. In order to discern what you're worshiping, I want you to just think of how you use your time. Maybe you don't have a lot of time. Maybe you're a parent or grandparent. Maybe you're a student and you're really busy and you're going, well, I don't have a lot of time, so I don't actually get a lot of alone time. Well, just think then where your mind goes wandering. What do you daydream about when nothing else is demanding your attention? Is it your career advancement and what it will take to get you there? Is it that relationship that you have longing for? Is it the fulfillment of some type of continued sexual fantasy? Is it thinking about the things you would do if you just had a little bit more money? Is it what you wish your family looked like instead of what it looked like back at Thanksgiving? Where's the thing, what is the thing that your mind wanders towards? Take time. Actually do some work in your heart and mind and allow things to come forward so that you can then take hold of those things and instead of using them as your gods, you can use them as a sacrifice. You can bring it before him to allow him 
to help rid you of those things. Second step we need to take after we've identified those things then is to set our mind on things above. Colossians 3, we read this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, those idols that we have. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, whether it's sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which are idolatry. Our minds, because we're people, will always end up going back to certain things. And those things might shift and they might be, take on new shape as we go about life and being, but the thing we need to do then is to take those things, take them captive, it says in the scriptures, and we need to surrender them to God, right? We need to put them to death. We need to recognize the evil that takes place, and we need to get rid of those things, and then we need to bring our mind to Jesus. One of the things we've talked a lot about as a church over the last number of years is practicing spiritual disciplines. We've done series on it. We've encouraged in small groups. This is something that we believe in, not just because it's something that we should do, but because it is the power to put death to these other things whether it's prayer or scripture reading or whether it's fasting or giving or serving or being in community, whether it's any one of those things, what we know takes place is this, that it takes our mental energy, it takes our heart engaged to really see flourishing in those things. And when we dedicate our hearts and our minds to those things, what ends up coming to the forefront is a replacement of our worship and idols. It becomes the focus of all those things, which is Jesus. If you find yourself continually captivated by something other than God, heed the warning that Pharaoh received. Let no other idol stand before me. Jesus would go on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Over the next couple minutes, what I want to invite us into is to just participate in one of these spiritual practices through a reflective time of prayer. And so wherever you are right now, I just want you to get in a comfortable posture. And as you sit there, what I'm, we're going to just turn down the lights so other people aren't looking at each other. But what we're going to do is we're just going to allow you some time and space to think about these things. And then I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer and then call some things to your mind and lead us into a time of prayer and call some things to mind and then we'll take time to worship God and appreciate how big he is and how wonderful he is. So as you sit where you are, I invite you to just let your mind wander. Think about the things that get you excited. What did you daydream about this week? What is it that your heart desires? Holy Spirit, reveal to us what we have set up as as idols in our lives, as the things that we worship over you.
Now, if you're willing, I, and you have to be willing to do this, you can't just say it, you can't just go through the steps, but if you're willing, if you want to see the death of that in your life, I encourage you to just ask for God's forgiveness for holding those things, and then offer them to him. Ask, invite him to begin the work of helping you remove those things from your life. Heavenly Father, I am just so struck by the Lord God, the, the idols in my life. Lord God, I bring mine before you. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross so you can bring healing to those places. So you could put a nail in them so that they do not have to continue to plague me. Lord God, would you help me to set my mind on you instead of those things. God, I know I'm going to want to come back time and time again. But Lord God, help me to fight against that temptation. Help me to resist it. Help me to walk in your ways. Help me not be like Pharaoh who when he chased the Israelites back out into the desert wanted to return to being king. Lord, help me up, elevate you above all these aspects of my lives. And God, for everybody in this room, Lord, I got, God, everyone who's offering something to you, Lord, I just, I thank you that you have died on the cross for them. Lord, I don't even know what the weight of those things is, but I know it must be incredibly heavy. And Lord God, we thank you that you carried that all onto the cross as you suffered, as you died for our forgiveness. But Lord God, we celebrate also that you rose to life and left behind that weight in the grave. And so God, I pray that others would receive that freedom, that healing that only you can bring. That a life lived in you and with you and through you and for you can bring. Finally, as we move from a place of, of giving that to God, I just want to encourage you to set your mind on things above. Just take time, focus on God, celebrate him, appreciate who Jesus is and allow him to show you who he can be, who he is as God above all things. God, we acknowledge you as the one who was the beginning of all things. We acknowledge you and we thank you for all that you have created. God, even as I, I drove to this place today, I just couldn't help but be amazed at the creation that is evident in our city and what surrounds us. And then, God, we... We know that it just pales in comparison because we can't see it through the gray that has come to our eyes because of the sin that we have brought. But Lord God, we thank you that you have redeemed us. God, we thank you that you have saved everyone who calls on your name, everyone who has put faith in you. Jesus, we thank you for what you did on the cross and for coming back to life and for bringing us with you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that you continue to live and move and breathe in us. We thank you that you can reveal these things to us so that we don't have to live like Pharaoh did, but we can live free as Jesus did. And Lord God, we pray for more of this to come alive in our being. We pray for more of this to, to bring us to the true state of being that you want us to be in. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that as we live and move and breathe, we would continue to see how wonderful you are, how great you are, how powerful you are, how loving you are, how merciful you are, how kind you are, how patient you are. 
And God, as we live and move and breathe from this place, we pray that you would get all the glory through our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name.